good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to all who have joined the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation organized webinar on dysphagia in the ICU, does it matter? Uh, Professor Mershin uh, Pillet, could you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. All right, thank you, thank you. So the, um, now um, we know that the, uh, the this how dysphagia, uh, how much dysphagia is important in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, particularly in rehabilitation when we are working as a team, uh, when we are working as a multidisciplinary team in rehabilitation, and uh, uh, particularly when it is in the ICU, that how much uh, it's important because of the risk of aspiration and so on. So it is an important topic for all of us that who are with interest in rehabilitation. Uh, I'm uh, glad that uh, Shamini, the uh, 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 Nanakara, uh, uh, took an interest in organizing this presentation by Professor uh, Mershen Pille, audiologist and speech therapist, SLT program coordinator at Massey University, uh, New Zealand. So I welcome him to the presentation and to the forum. And uh, let me invite uh, Professor Pille to make the presentation. Professor Pille, over to you. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Dr. Shamani Hetiarachi. And I'd like to also thank the Rehabilitation Committee for inviting me to give you this talk on dysphagia. The title of my presentation, which is coming on the screen right now, is Dysphagia in the ICU, Does It Matter? And uh, these are the affiliations that I have currently. I work at Massey University, and um, I'm also an honorary um, um, lecturer or associate professor at the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal. So this is how I'm going to start the presentation off. When I say I'm a speech therapist and I work with swallowing, these are the responses I get. People look at me and they are just not quite sure what to make of that, okay? And I think that's pretty obvious because if you had to introduce yourself as a speech therapist and you say you work in ICU and you work with swallowing, people get confused um, as to the connection between swallowing and with speech and so on, and rightly so. So what I'm going to do is maybe just progress a little bit into how that con confusion happens and what my object of my fiction is. So this is a, an endoscopic solar stuff. I'm going to put that a bit softer. Um, so what you're looking at is a swallow uh, from above and you're looking through the, the basically the open airway there. And as you can see, the green liquid that went through was swallowed adequately because you can't see any residue there and there was no obvious coughing and choking. I can tell you lots more about endoscopic solo studies, but that's really what it is that I work with. And that's, that's what I'm obsessed by and what I think about all of the time. And so in terms of working with that solo and what you looked at was a lovely, beautiful, clean, normal solo. But then there's this. And in this version of the solo, ugly things happen. So as you can see in this uh, picture here, if you look carefully toward where, where my um, little curse is, you can see um, the vocal folds are not closing together adequately. That epiglottis is not going backwards and closing over the airway. And in that little still version of what you can see, there's loads and loads of bubbles. Um, and those bubbles are bubbled, not liquid, but bubbled saliva. That green dye you see there was the person being tinted with uh, just a couple of drops in their tongue and swallowing their own saliva. So in this instance, you're looking at someone who's an ICU, who's got a tracheostomy, and there's also an NG tube, uh, if, if he's on NG tube feeds, who's having immense difficulty in managing even their own saliva. So that's the sort of case that I'm particularly interested in, in working with when we're looking at uh, patients in ICU. And, and figuring out whether there's something there that we can do to help them. So does dysphagia matter in those three areas? I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about dysphagia incidents and ICUs. I'm also hoping that we can chat a bit more uh, because it's so topical, can't avoid it, looking at COVID-19. And then of course, why? Why is it that somebody might present with dysphagia and what are the risk factors that we need to be uh, taking into account? 
And then the third issue that I want to look at is how do we, so once we begin to see it, what do we do about it? So how do we recognize and manage dysphagia? And especially because it's of primary concern in an ICU is the aspiration risk. So in terms of incidence of dysphagia in ICUs, there's really not a lot of clear detailed data on an incidence of dysphagia in ICUs nationally and internationally. In the last year and a half, maybe two years, because of the focus on COVID, there's a burgeoning database that's growing. But I'm gonna share with you one of the more uh, potent star uh, studies that, have been, that, that was done by Sheffield et al. in 2017, and it's a Swiss study. And they studied a large number of people in ICU, so it's 1,304 adults. And what they did was they screened everyone three hours post extubation. But they did a fascinating study in that they just followed these people through all the way into uh, they just from discharge to the um, to, into discharge into discharge phase essentially from the hospital. And so what you can see on the slide here is a nice clear story of the incidence of dysphagia. And if you look carefully, you've got 12.4% of the people within the first 24 hours post extubation with dysphagia. That number goes down a little bit when they discharge from ICU, because in other words, they, they tend to be uh, stable enough um, and, and with, with minimal risk when they leave ICU. But look at their, their discharge uh, from the hospital, where 60.4% of the entire cohort that was studied showed uh, that they were still dysphagic. Now, the significance of this is, is uh, it's laid in, in, the, in the conclusions here. And not only does it show that dysphagia is indeed common in post-extubation people, in fact, the term post-extubation dysphagia is used quite commonly. It's common in both your ICU patients, but also they, st they stick with this. They, they develop condition, may have been pre-admission to ICU, may have been in ICU, and they keep this condition up until their discharge, a fair number of them, 60.4% in this particular study. So essentially, without going into too much details with regards to the univariate hazard ratio there, et cetera, what's critical to note is that uh, the study shows the direct relationship of dysphagia and issues around mortality, for example, and of course, the person's ability to manage their um, swallow, to manage their, uh, their nutrition, to manage their airway safety. Um, and like it says in the point number two of the conclusion is that dysphagia was identified as an independent predictor of death. And so that's something to take note of, because if we know that, then we know we need to be doing something about that, because it's been a clearly connected study that, that's shown us this. And so essentially what we're looking at is how dysphagia, and this is general, not, uh, not just for the study that's quoted there, but how dysphagia actually does result in greater enteral tube feeding, uh, longer length of uh, mechanical ventilation, usage of mechanical ventilation, and of course, ICU and hospital stays, uh, the length of stays are, are larger or longer, and there's a good direct reference to hospital mortality increasing. And so what, what at least in South Africa, and I'm obviously because I'm from South Africa, I'm, I'm looking at some of the data that comes from, uh, that, that we've had a look at, and the South African surgical outcome studies and a few other studies that were connected to this show that especially with the rise of non-communicable diseases within the first month, the first uh, 30 days, um, that and infectious diseases, we know as broad categories of care and both categories of um, illness and disease, a fair number of these uh, non-communicable diseases and infectious diseases will be associated with dysphagia. We don't know how much because of course, the, the nature of our data collection does not allow us to, to, to get to that level of detail. But for example, we know that there's a high incidence of stroke in, in various uh, parts of the world, including South Africa, but, but in Sri Lanka, in, um, in the BRICS countries, in Brazil, in Russia, in China, across the world. And so within stroke, and one of the, the key critical issues to note is that almost there's a high incidence, and I'll be talking about the incidence levels uh, shortly, but a large percentage of that population, just within the non-communicable diseases category, uh, have a comorbidity of dysphagia. 
So that's something to take note of in terms of who we see coming through our hospital doors. Another issue is that often it's just not noticed. It's not, and, and for, for good reason, because there's a whole range of other really important critical uh, life uh, survival issues that um, when people look at the bigger picture, uh, noticing how somebody swallows and whether they manage their saliva well enough or whether they manage to eat well enough is almost incidental in a particular kind of high uh, acute care context. And, and, and of course, in terms of looking at a patient, um, that's not something one often does as the first point, point of call. So it is something that is overlooked in terms of managing especially critical patients. Uh, and this isn't true only for adults in ICU, definitely in NICUs and in, in ICUs as well. Uh, when you're looking at the number of uh, neonates with feeding difficulties, as in the study that's quoted here, 70.9%, pretty large number for little ones who've just entered the world uh, to develop a, a, a critical skill like feeding uh, for it to, to occur in, in that kind of unit or in that sort of state of care. So what the slide is really demonstrating is it's there. Okay, we have some um, statistics to show us that it's something that is not uh, made up or it's certainly not an incidental uh, occurrence. It's certainly part and parcel of what happens in an ICU context. Um, we know from high income countries that there's uh, significant data that shows without, you know, with definitely a, a good uh, data set that uh, there's over 50% of patients in ICUs that present with dysphagia. So, and I think that's important. And, and because most um, low to middle income countries uh, are not as data rich as say our Northern cousins or people who are in high income countries, we know that uh, we, we extrapolate that data. Um, and there's no reason for why we can't suspect that this is also the case for uh, patients in our ICUs in low to middle income countries. Um, and then there's other issues around the way in which the diagnoses of dysphagia is managed. So we also know that um, in terms of just the technical diagnostic categories, the ICD codes that are used, et cetera, uh, that, that even if you look through those coding, there's critical illness neuropathies, which are pretty high, so 91%, 42% of trauma patients who have been intubated within for, for the first 42 hours, 48 hours at least. And of course, you have people with um, the cervical sp uh, spinal cord injuries as another example, 80% of them. So in, in those diagnostic categories, almost all of those uh, clinical uh, cases will present with some level of dysphagia. And I don't want to sound over dramatic on the case, but essentially what I'm saying is that there's a risk that these clinical uh, populations will present with dysphagia. Uh, of course, there's patients who are traumatized and those with autotracheal intubations that have been intubated for longer than 48 hours that will present with, um, with difficulties or issues associated with their swallow mechanism. I think, I think the last point is something I really want to emphasize in that when we're looking at people with dysphagia, it's not just a simple description of, oh, isn't it a pity they can't eat or drink? It's the fact that that represents or signifies a risk in that their aspiration uh, is high. So 45% is, is possible uh, for patients with uh, dysphagia to also as aspirate. And critically, and this is a vital sign, is that when they do aspirate, often at the bedside, one in five people you will work with, 20%, will not tell you. It is just not obvious. There are no apparent or any obvious signs of aspiration-related events uh, because they're sharp, they're sudden, they're swift. Sure, you will document the uh, decrease in saturation and one will be able to notice that aspiration pneumonia setting in, but the event itself may occur, may occur as part of a silent uh, progression and is not obviously noted because there's no coughing or there's no um, other obvious signs of, of aspiration. In this next slide, or this last point in the slide, I beg your pardon, um, one of the key things, and I'm just reiterating the point, is that when you're looking at why people aspirate one of the key factors may be the fact that they're actually tracheostomized. And as a result, and as we know, the tracheostomy in and of itself 
may be the direct cause of the dysphagia. And so patients with tracheostomies uh, present with, in this instance that's quoted, 52% of the people with tracheostomies, just tracheostomies alone, had uh, a, a dysphagia, of whom 86% aspirated, and of that percentage, 83% did so silently. Large number of people with upper respiratory tract issues with airway compromise uh, will not uh, show any obvious signs of aspiration and or the fact that they are dysphagic. So um, with COVID-19, we've discovered, and especially obviously since the studies have been done, that, that this, the, the, all that has been highlighted uh, through COVID-19 is just how prevalent dysphagia is and what it can do, obviously, in terms of the, the person's ability to manage their swallow mechanisms. So when you're looking at the first study that was done uh, quite early on, actually, when the pandemic began, Dawson et al., um, they confirmed that dysphagia is indeed prevalent in the ICU context, but importantly, that there is a crucial role of intensive swallow rehabilitation for mechanically ventilated MV patients and tracheostomized patients. Uh, Judy Regan and her team did a study looking at a whole range of uh, variables, but uh, it, uh, early on in, in this year at COVID-19 patients in, in ICUs. And what was critical, and if you just draw your your eyes to the fact that 90% had altered oral intake. In other words, either reduced oral intake or modified uh, diets to, to, to eat. In other words, they had difficulties. And that it led up to, so 59% who had to be fed in alternative methodologies using tube feeds, and 36% of the patients with COVID-19 in ICUs had to be put nil by mouth or nil per os in um, NPO. Of that lot that they studied, two-thirds, 66%, had dysphonia, 27% and 37% had persistent dysphagia as well as persistent dysphonia, respectively. In that same study, most of the patients that we looked at with the tube feeding, 36% um, required their tube feeding and were actually not allowed to take anything orally. And so this is a significant descriptor that allows us to understand the nature of uh, dysphagia as being relatively prevalent amongst the COVID-19 population. Santblom et al., and this is a study that uh, was done quite recently, so it's um, October, um, where their description of a range of features that are associated with dysphagia is of particular significance to us. And as you can see listed in the slide, the secretions that, uh, that were pooled, that were identified in 92% of the people with dysphagia, signs of silent aspiration in 44%, that's, that's quite a significant number, and 100% um, of the patients with, uh, in ICUs with dysphagia had residue post-swallow. So in other words, they'd eat something and we think they've swallowed it. They, they look like they're swallowing, but their stuff's uh, left stuck in their, in their throat and their vesicular and their hypopharynx, et cetera. 76% had impaired vocal cord movement, and we all know what that means in terms of the open airway or the fact that, it's, um, that you might have difficulties with vocal fold abduction and therefore keeping the airway compromised and open. Um, and you've also got other issues with the health and the status of the airway, specifically erythema and edema regarding the vocal folds and tissue associated with, uh, with the pharyngeal re region or in the hypopharynx of which there were 60% of the population that were studied. So again, just showing that um, what we knew already, but this is more highlighted under COVID and patients in ICU. So why is it that people develop a dysphagia in ICU and what are some of the key factors? I'm gonna review the, the one that I did allude to early on, uh, the effect of using tracheostomy tubes and or being ventilator dependent. And there's a whole range of effects that um, might um, be considered or things that we uh, know happen to people who are on uh, uh, ventilators or are tracheostomized. And as you can see on the slide, so on the right-hand side is one of my favorite radiographs. You can see, as my little arrow is going through down the cursor there, you'll see where the end of your tube is, and you'll see that it bypasses. So obviously, you're looking at a lateral radiograph, and the 
C1 is there, C2, C3, C4, 5, 6, and C7 is occluded by the shoulder. But the point I'm making is if you look at the root of the uh, tube, so that you're feeding your neck, oops, sorry, the nasogastric tube, the relationship of the nasogastric tube to the structures that are involved directly in swallowing, in other words, the ones that initiate or are uh, involved in, uh, in, in initiating and bolus transport, and of course, the whole autonomic uh, process of swallowing. And then um, having a look at, uh, for example, the residue in the vellaculi. So that picture you see, that white um, bit of liquid that's there is um, stuck or is uh, positioned in the vellaculi. And then of course, and this is the critical point here, is that in this region where my cursor is, um, lies the, or is, is roughly where the vocal folds would be. Notice the, the, the distance or the placement of the tracheostomy tube in relation to the vocal folds. And why this is significant is because if an aspiration event was to occur, and if it occurred higher up, in other words, above the level of the tracheostomy tube, it, um, it may not be identified or picked up if you're suctioning from, say, beneath the, the vocal folds or below the tube itself, through the tube. In other words, um, it may not be identified just through uh, suction materials, et cetera. So, so oftentimes, and this is in a clinical, uh, clinical significance, is that in, in attempting to identify someone who has aspirated um, and doing it through an examination of suction liquids, et cetera, may not give you sufficient data to support whether the person is aspirating at the level of the of, at the level of the vocal folds, in other words, if it's going into the upper airway or uh, being swallowed unsuccessfully. On this slide, what you see is essentially a summary of some of the information that I put in the previous slide. Um, in broad terms, there are structural, valving, and mechanical deficits that occur as a result of the use of a tracheostomy tube, specifically the use of a tracheostomy tube, and of course, uh, as uh, also as a result of endotracheal uh, intubation. So as you can see from all of those um, structures and the, the valving deficits, and as well as the mechanical issues that may be affected, naturally these will impact on the person's ability to swallow their saliva, to manage their reflux, to manage all kinds of other bodily fluids, including if they're on oral feeds, manage their oral feeding as well. So you've got a whole range of deficits that, that um, impact as a result of uh, the, the tube or the um, tracheostomy itself, yeah, intubation of the tracheostomy. In this slide here, I'm just gonna play this little picture of, so what are some, what actually might happen when we're looking at the swallow. And in this particular slide here, as you can see, I want you to pay attention to what happens where my cursor is and that little blank thing that went down. Um, those are the, are the three key factors that we're wanting to make sure doesn't happen, or if it does happen, then we need to make sure we're taking care of it. I'm going to play the video again, and the first thing to note is the following, uh, that there's obviously a delay in the bolus transfer all the way through the pharynx down into the esophagus, and that arrow that you see is popping on screen shows you micro-aspiration or evidence of the liquid going into that airway, which is what's in, in that front bit there. So, the, and if you've noticed the person didn't move, and I can tell you because this is a study that we did, shows that uh, the patient did not have any overt signs. They were not, they were silently aspirating. So in this video, you're looking at three key things. There's penetration of material into the airways. There's aspiration into the airway. And of course, there's also silent aspiration. And these are the three things that we really get worried about. And because aspiration is obviously not visible and not easily identified at the best side, because you can't with any certain measure except an instrumental assessment that you've just seen, it may often be underestimated in ICUs just because we, we can't see it and it's not as obvious as, as what um, is possible through a radiographic assessment or for that matter an endos endoscopic swallow study. So we have an increasing number of people um, with this issue only because we can see it better now, okay? However, 
it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because we don't have the equipment to identify it. And of course, we know that there are a variety of ways in which one can verify the presence or at least the signs of an aspiration um, event at, at the bedside. We can talk a bit more about that later. But the, the bits of information that's below this increasing uh, comment about the increasing and persistent uh, frustrating problem that dysphagia represents is that um, we know that um, it does with input, with help, it, it, we, we get better survival rates um, in ICU. We know that when it's being managed um, with people who are tracheostomized, there's also ways in which that this will improve or at least um, intervention will improve the ability to manage the like secretions. And we also know that um, when patients are in ICU, and if they are not actively moving and doing things with not just their body, their swallow mechanism itself, we know that a level of deconditioning occurs and that there's just used to dystrophy that sets in. And this almost what one might class as a, um, a long-term consequence, either it could be both a long-term or transient consequence, is definitely something that we see throughout ICUs in the world. And so the idea is that if it's there and if it's an issue and we don't take care of it, we don't actually look at it, then of course we are adding to a whole range of difficulties with regards to the, uh, to the problem. And so you can choose to do this. We can choose to put our heads in the sands and hide from the problem because it's just too much to deal with. Or we can choose to have a look at it, to open our eyes and go, Maybe there's something here, and maybe that, that, that there are ways in which we can deal with this. And so here are some of the ways in which you can recognize and manage dysphagia. And the first thing that I'm wanting to talk about is screening. So making the problem visible is, of course, important, because otherwise, if you can't see it, it doesn't exist, you don't deal with it. So the, the first issue is about how screening is, is vitally important. We do know, as this is slide, um, if you read off the slide, uh, that aspiration risk is something we want to make sure is not significant in, the, in an ICU environment uh, because of the fact, not just because of the health outcomes, well, I suppose uh, the immediate health outcomes, but of course the um, effect on the person's um, length of stay in the hospital, the financial impact, the whole cost benefits of having people stay in hospital are something we need to take into account. We also know that there's a whole range of negative effects on alternative nutritional support. So looking at nasogastric or pig tubes or any tube feeds, et cetera, are expensive uh, methods to keep uh, nutrition maintained. And we know that being in hospitals and having reduced immunity is a big issue that needs to be managed, as well as the fact that um, there's also an, a tracheostomy need or an increase of a tracheostomy need. Um, oral hygiene and the fact that um, patients' oral hygiene in hospitals and especially in ICUs, while being managed adequately in most contexts, may actually be a risk factor that results in, for example, higher incidence of pneumonitis than you would see in a general ward hospital or, or general hospital ward or in non-hospital pa patients. And in fact, this is a study that we did recently looking at the increased oropharyngeal colonization and the impact it has on a person's abilities to swallow their saliva and when they don't swallow adequately, what happens with this uh, bacteria when it gets flushed into their airways and of course compromises the, uh, you know, sort of gets them sicker quicker with the pneumonitis. Uh, and of course, there's all the other associated psychological effects of not being able to eat, of being sick and of just not managing something that you didn't have to think about before, swallowing. So these are all of the issues that, that need to be taken into account. And I'm gonna segue a little bit here to talk about accreditation standards. And this belongs to uh, the Joint Commission for uh, uh, Hospital Accreditation, essentially an American standard that was developed for international usage across the world for uh, if people were to sign up for accreditation of the standard. It's not that, the standard exists that I'm, I'm making reference uh, to here. It's the fact that what the standard did was that it raised awareness in, in the early 2000s of just how prevalent people with stroke uh, were, or just how big the problem is in the stroke population with regards to dysphagia. So 
so much so that it was deemed uh, necessary to screen every single patient on entry into um, a hospital with a stroke diagnosis for uh, a dysphagia. So that's something to take into account because, of course, as a result of that, many countries around the world then started scrambling around, well, what do we use? How do we screen this? And what tools are, are important? On this slide, here's a list of uh, both screening tools and uh, dysphagia assessment tools. Um, there generally there are a set of standardized informal procedures one can use so there are uh, for example water swallow trials that need to be administered in a particular way that have specific fail pass criteria etc there are also a screening checklist observational checklist standardized checklist that may be used to identify someone that you can pick up and send them off for a full assessment and those screening tools can be used by any healthcare professional but when it comes to doing the full dysphagia assessment, then lies the issue because of the fact that we know in most low to middle income countries, specialist practitioners who work with dysphagia are rare. And so when you're looking at things that need to be done, oftentimes this may be shared by other professionals. But what I'm talking about in this particular slide is the way in which a, a trained dysphagia practitioner may engage a clinical swallow evaluation at the bedside, which essentially is behavioral, there are standardized clinical soil evaluations that may be used as well, uh, but of course, these rely largely on observational analyses. Then there's the, the complementary gold standard um, of both the fees, so it's a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of soloing and video fluoroscopic swallow studies. And essentially what they do is that they give you, um, and, and you've seen already both those studies uh, for a few seconds each in my slides, and uh, it's rich with information. And of course, uh, a trained eye can pick up all of the different um, features of the swallow mechanism that are impaired in order for one to assist the swallow rehabilitation process. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is that in a few seconds that I showed you those videos, something as little as three to five seconds can take quite a few minutes of a, a trained professional going through a frame-by-frame -frame analysis to analyze the nature of the disorder. So it is a specialized function in a sense. Uh, usually that specialization is done by a speech and language therapist or a speech language pathologist, depending on the country you're in. And these procedures are often done jointly with ENT, radiology, radiography, et cetera. Um, and it depends on the nature and the policies of the country that you're working in, but oftentimes it is the speech therapist that leads this process because of their specialist knowledge in terms of dysphagia. So that's the assess screening and assessment mm -hmm. overview. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the screening by health professionals because such is the reality is that we might find that non-specialist uh, uh, practitioners may be doing the screening. And so the main thing that we found in the study we did a little while ago was when uh, swallow screening was done by trained nurses and doctors, it was feasible and reliable. So in other words, um, if one randomly approaches a patient and says, here's a glass of water, drink this and let's see how it goes, okay? That almost always is going to result in something negative and at worst is poor clinical practice because of the nature of the information such uh, activities can lead to and the fact that it's not rigorous or systematic enough to analyze and, and actually uh, pick up uh, validly a person with a swallowing disorder. But when trained, that mm -hmm. whole scenario changes. There are other... Um, uh, factors that are related to this. And of course, these are the key things that we look out for. So we do know that when somebody presents with any of those five factors that you see on the slide, uh, with at least two or more of them, they have, these are important predictors of dysphagia, not just for dysphagia itself, but also for the risk of uh, aspiration at the bedside. So we know that these people, when they present with two or more of these, will uh, most likely be aspiration, candidates for aspiration. On the slide, what I'm going to put up is a list of the kinds of tools that one could consider, the more um, pop ones in popular use, and, and um, uh, both by nurses and other healthcare professionals, especially in acute care. Uh, you're welcome to get a copy. You will get a copy of these slides, so you can have a look at these in more detail. The bottom line here is that there are a variety of tools to use uh, that people can be trained in, in using reliably and validly. Take note of uh, methodologies like the blue dye screen, so the modified Evans blue dye test, 
which, and this is a key note, because uh, I certainly know some countries still use this, so be aware of the fact that methylene blue itself, when used with tracheostomy, their patients with tracheostomy, um, in the past, um, there's been a moratorium on the use of it because of the fact that it's been associated with deaths, especially in people dying uh, because of the dye itself, uh, the methylene blue. Um, uh, and uh, as a result of the gut absorption or uh, other issues related to that to their digestive system. So it is something that that usually we discourage or is definitely discouraged uh, and that we rather or use generally just use food coloring to, to do a blue dye assessment. And a blue dye assessment, of course, is only done for a person with a tracheostomy to identify if there's any um, evidence of stained um, saliva or body fluids that are suctioned out of the tracheostomy tube. So the main thing that I'd like to sort of go to now is, you know, we know that all of these tools exist and we know that people do it in different ways. So what is an effective solo screening tool? There's your standard definition of what a swallow screening tool needs to do. We know that it needs to be quick, it needs to be minimally invasive, and we need for it to have a high sensitivity and specificity for identifying both risk, dysphagia, and aspiration. And it also has to have a clear scoring system, obviously, where there's a clear pass or fail criteria that we use. So these are the things that we need to have. Um, but we know in the real world, you've got all kinds of issues happening. You've got people who speak different languages who may not understand things. So when you ask people a question based on your checklist that you might use, it may not be adequately understood. And this is a critical factor many people with aphasia have a comorbidity of dysphagia. So therein lies a huge dilemma. If they can't understand you or they can't express themselves through their language because of their, their, their essential neurological disorder, then you've got a problem, okay? There's also all kinds of resource constraints. So certainly in low and middle income countries, personnel, specialized personnel like dietitians, nurses, specialist nurses, speech therapists, radiologists, endoscopy um, units and endoscopy uh, equipment in general are really available. And when they are available, they're on big demand. So when you're looking at that, that's something to take into account for effectiveness and how something within a system needs to be managed. There's also issues around the competence levels and training for people involved. Do we all know and mean the same thing by the word screening or even by the activity or task of screening? And there's a whole range of other factors, two of which, three of which are listed there regarding the hospital sector structure, looking at patient flow and composition of healthcare, and then finally looking at hospital size and, and of course the patient load. Busy hospitals, high patient loads, uh, really focusing on survivorhood in an ICU uh, and lots of what I would refer to as that section has been labeled real world issues. So in between and betwixt this chaos of the real world, what do you do when you want to push an agenda for where we know this is something that, that's a big factor in ICUs? So um, we need to develop or look at not just the, the screening tools we select because, and so my solution for that last one, the last slide is definitely to establish a quick and easy tool. There are many tools that can be used that, that take all of three minutes to, to use by any healthcare staff member uh, in an ICU uh, who can be trained in a few, in a short space of time to administer the tool validly and reliably. And we can talk more about that later if you like. What are your treatment options? There's a whole range of them. And the main thing is you want this person who's in the hospital ICU to do better. And you want them to have a restored airflow. You want them to be performing, phonating adequately. Uh, they should be successful, at least heading toward a cuff deflation trial. You, you might even want to look at doing things like speaking valve trials, et cetera. Uh, and of course, critically, secretion management. And, and I found over the years of my work in, uh, in ICU is that many people uh, would say to me, well, why are you here? You, you know, this, this person's not swallowing. Why do you need to work with them? And that's exactly the reason we'd work with them. One is to get them to swallow them, but more importantly, no, they are swallowing. It's very rare to find a patient with aphasia. And just because they're not eating doesn't mean they're not swallowing. People swallow, as you know, body fluids, secretion, and of course, in hospital, incidents of gastroesophageal reflux might occur, they're swallowing that, 
They're managing all kinds of other body fluids that might be mucus, etc. So yes, they need to be checked to see how competent they are doing that. And so secretion management is indeed a big issue. There are all kinds of things that I'm listing on the slide regarding medications and the use of strategies um, that are listed down there for, for people to consider. Um, in an ICU, oral hygiene is something of prime importance. That's also another role and something that you would get involved with. And of course, feeding trials. So there's, a, there's some hospitals that will absolutely refuse uh, to proceed with oral trials until oral hygiene is exceptional. And with good regard, because there's a, as you well know, there's a high level of aspiration pneumonitis uh, in patients with bacteria that can easily flush down toward their airways. Uh, and of course, st structured systematic dysphagia rehabilitation, swallow therapy, using a variety of therapies ranging from manual therapies, so myofascial releases, manual-based therapies for, for um, looking at muscle range and strength, et cetera, and uh, fancier pieces of equipment like electrical stimulation devices if they're available, and uh, using a whole range of other alternative diet modification strategies, uh, diet compensatory strategies that are coupled with that, so looking at posture, position, pace, et cetera, and then oral intake. And I'm going to, um, on the next few slides, show you a little bit around uh, oral intake because uh, I, I do have a problem as a speech therapist working with people with dysphagia where um, usually a, uh, the, the, a person in charge of the healthcare, uh, in that instance, it might be a medical doctor, who will say, just feed the patient, just see how they're doing, mm -hmm. or let's see how they manage in a thick liquid, um, or go and puree the diet. Now, those words mean different things to different people. So how thick is thick? So if you're thick in a liquid, would it be something that coats a spoon? Would it be something that flows slowly down into a straw that you could suck up with? Um, what does a puree diet mean? Does it mean it's something you blenderize in a machine or you grind with a pestle and a mortar? Um, how, do you, how do you prepare this? What does it actually look like and feel like and move? Because the nature and the flow of the foods, the liquids that you have, are critical in a patient with dysphagia. If it flows in the wrong way, if it gets stuck in the hypopharynx, if you've got a whole range of issues of the foods going down into the esophagus swiftly and efficiently, and there are problems with their swallowing, guess where it's gonna end up? So, off, so the, the diet modifications are critical, and I want to draw your attention to the whole issue of oral intake and how to manage, or some of the things that you might find useful. The ITSI framework, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, and here's a, um, a disclosure. I'm on the board of directors for the ITSI, so I'm promoting it because I believe in it. And um, this is a not-for-profit organization that looks at different ways in which you can modify foods. If you haven't yet um, had a look at it, have a look at it, please have a look at that website that's listed there to see how you can classify the foods that you give people with dysphagia. Uh, there are many methods, and these are the reasons for why we do it. Essentially, it's safety. Um, and because, and like I said earlier, because oral intake is not a one size fits all. Uh, but just a quick review of some of the things you might find on this website that's useful, the definitions of what it means to have puree, for example, how you make it, uh, and the characteristics you're looking out for when you develop these foods for patients, whatever the foods are. And then there's also some uh, testing methods. How do you know what size the, the bolus needs to be? So for example, your thumb, is the size 1.5 by 1.5 for adults is the size of the bolus, the food that you need to give somebody if they're on a soft and bite-sized um, diet. Um, the fork that you see in the picture below there is when you press your thumb into the fork and it um, blanches just as when it blanches, that's exactly, and usually that's the, the, the necessary pressure that's, uh, that, that is required to deform the bolus. And if the person can't do that, then they can't actually um, have that texture of food. So there's a whole range of guidelines that you might want to have a look at for that, and they're all pretty useful. Uh, that's just showing the scientific backing around the blanching here. Incidentally, when you push down onto the food and it begins to deform, that measures it at 17 kilopascals, which is exactly the same tongue strength that's required to do the same action intraorally. So that's the rationale for why we do that. Um, the, there's also an ITSI flow test where we use a, a syringe and there are particular guidelines on what type of syringe to use and how to use it. 
uh, to measure the type of flow of liquids you give someone. So if you give them a thickened liquid, what type of liquid thickness is acceptable for this person? And there are ways you can measure that. It's a brilliantly simple test to use, but highly effective in standardizing the flow of the liquid you're giving someone. So please have a look at this website and see if that's going to be useful for you. Here are some references, and I'm looking forward to the discussion that uh, we're going to have. That's my email address. Talk to me about any of these issues that I've raised. I'd be very happy to entertain them, and I look forward to the discussion that's going to follow. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pillay, for that very interesting and uh, very uh, comprehensive overlook on the uh, the dysphagia in the ICU setting, especially. Um, I wonder if our speech therapy colleagues uh, have any questions uh, for Professor Pillay. I'm sure you will uh, start on a big discussion. Uh, you can unmute and talk. Uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions around uh, any specific queries that you might have had about what I said, or maybe even uh, yeah. practice-based issues or whatever. Don't be shy. <laughs> uh, just one question from me. How do you select the best screening method? I mean, uh, just uh, excuse me for my you know, ignorance on those things, but uh, just wondering. So I think that, look, it does depend on availability and the resources mm -hmm. that are around, but the, the, the two guidelines that I may uh, that, that are going to be quite useful, I think, in thinking around the selection of the screening test is to look at the logistical or the, the, the point at which it's going to be implemented. So if it's for a nurse, for example, may not have any specialized knowledge in dysphagia, then that screening test, um, so there's, there's, there's a variety of screening tests that one could use. In Western Europe, there's a water solo trial that's been used, um, and, it's, and it's based on uh, the force with which it, uh, a, a person can, uh, sorry, how it's administered to a person and how the person can respond and the force with, with which they're able to uh, manage this, the effort, sorry, that they, they use to manage a water swallow trial. One of the, the studies that I quoted in the slides um, re referenced a, a standardized water swallow trial. And what was convincing about that study is that there were 3,000 people who were trialed using, um, they did a cross-reference to a gold standard evaluation. They used a 90 um, milliliter or three ounce water solar trial. And there's a standard way in which this was administered. And they compared it to an endoscopic solar study. And there was a very high sensitivity and specificity of that. So in summary, whatever we're using needs to indicate or have at least some evidence that shows uh, there's good sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and, and like I, I said, they are, it's not a random, methodology, there's a standard methodology for administering these, these um, screening tests. Hope I've answered that. I'm not sure if I've covered the, the key uh -huh. thing. Yeah, yeah, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Any more questions uh, from our speech therapy colleague? I can always pick and peep and put them on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a whole lot of them. So is Shamini around? Maybe what I can do is ask currently um, what are the, the main practices or some of the issues that people find. Um, so first of all, how many people here are actually doing screening or working with people in, in, in ICU? Is this even an issue for you? Yeah, I think you all can talk. Uh, okay. Marka. Uh... I've got a question uh, here. Oh, sorry. This is Thank Halmya, uh, top merchant. Um, this is Halmya. I'm sorry, my video isn't working. So sorry about it. <laughs> Thank you, Samia. Hi. To answer your question, yes, uh, all of the um, therapists who are working at hospital work in the university mail, in the ICU setting. Mm -hmm. And um, more or less, we will always encounter with people who have uh, issues, multiple issues in the ICU setting. So. It's not just simple dysphagia, but of course, other issues as well with the cognition and not being alert, all that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the key aspects, uh, like issues, sometimes we have it is the uh, to decision, um, like, okay, whether to continue with NGO or not, because uh, in our case, they may not be able to come back sometimes. So 
like once they discharge, they will be discharged into a peripheral hospital or far away. So they may not be able to contact the therapist who's been seen. So we had to really work very well with the caregivers to mm -hmm. be sure that this is the correct decision that we are giving uh, until we this until we are able to free them. So, um, so and, and what are some of the difficulties you're experiencing in, in, in the whole flow of the, the work? like the process. So for example, when you say making the correct decision, sorry, I'm following up with the question. I hope this doesn't put you on the spot. No, no, it's not a question. I just gave you a comment about the work that we are doing. That's all. Okay. So, so can, I, can I maybe ask a little bit more around some of the, the possible barriers that you experience to, 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 to the work that you're doing within, with, with your clients or with the patients that you're working with? or at um, any? Yeah, for me personally, one of the things that I actually encountered recently is to do with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a kind of a decision about the intervention actually uh, motion mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's like when they are in ICU of course very limited things that we can do but they will be mm -hmm. then sent to a ward but within that also because of their tiredness or inability to engage the usual stuff that we are practicing seems to be impossible. Um, okay. even like holding the breath and do a swallow or like mm -hmm. uh, that kind of even exercises are like um, normal techniques mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. if some of the patient doesn't work the other mm -hmm. group of course it's easy uh, but the ones who are going through this um, incubation and then who are recovering management mm -hmm. I found it to be a little tough compared to other normal dysphagia who's in ICU and recovering I think you're not alone in finding that. I think most people are complaining about the effects of COVID and its impact on people's cognitive abilities and the ability just to attend to the task of eating uh, or doing anything associated with, with swallowing. And I suspect what, what might happen, and most people have made the decision not to engage in active rehabilitation, but more looking at uh, indirect compensations, for example. So looking at more diet modifications, if that's the issue, or looking at uh, managing posture position, you know, all of the other key modification strategies or compensation strategies that may at least ameliorate the problem uh, as they're going through. But thank you so much for that. I see there's a couple of other questions in, um, in the chat and I'm gonna speak to uh, Budima, who I just spoke to earlier on. Hello, Budima. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so you, you wanted to, uh, to follow up with the question of, do you recommend screening for all ICU patients? Um, no, okay. So, um, and I'm saying this deservedly because of the fact that not all ICU patients will be candidates for dysphagia. So it's no point in having to use an energy or waste energy and resources in, in doing a, a whole ward round where people won't, won't need it. However, the trick is that initial referral or the initial uh, point of contact, clinical contact, we're having to identify this patient's need for the swallow screen. That needs to be a refined process. So sometimes we earn the side of caution and because they're in a high uh, sort of acute care setting, then people might be overly worried about their ability to, uh, to, to swallow safely. So, so the, the, the bottom line is, and it sounds controversial, it might even sound like a contradiction of what I said, uh, but, but the answer is no for, for all patients, but certainly for your high-risk group patients. So definitely stroke, all stroke. Um, and even, and you might've seen on the list of the three uh, pathologies that are put up that, that one of them was um, cervical um, cord injuries. There's actually quite a high incidence of people with um, spinal cord injuries, cervical spinal cord injuries, specifically with comorbidities of dysphagia, uh, both pre-surgical and post-surgical. Post-surgical mainly because of the transient effect of the uh, dysphagia or impact of the, uh, of the anterior cervical surgeries, for example, on the swallowing ability. So those are some of the things to think about there. Thank you for the question. I'm hoping that answers it, Budima. Okay. Uh, I've also got a question from Shamini. Uh, thank you, Shamini. And um, you said, can you speak to particular patterns of dysphagia you're observing with clients with COVID? Um, yes. Uh, so, so basically, and so this is, by the way, since moving to New Zealand, which has been uh, earlier this year, uh, I, there's, they haven't been doing much work with, with COVID clients. And I think initially you'd understand for the obvious reasons. However, from my knowledge of how uh, COVID clients and the work of uh, working with COVID clients in South Africa, 
generally, and this has been highlighted by, by the earlier question, was that the, net, the level of fatigue is an issue. Uh, there are certainly, there are two key factors, the co-occurrence of dysphonia and dysphagia. So many of the patients, and I put up some of the stats in the slide earlier on, there's a 27% incidence of uh, dysphagia and a 37% incidence of dysphonia. And these two things together are a, an, an awful formula to have, because as you know, dysphonia is often an indication of adequate uh, vocal fold adduction and so that often tends to be difficult for a person to achieve in terms of uh, swallow efficiency and and making sure that the airway is closed off adequately um hoping i, I cover that shamani okay yeah. right. um there are a few more questions professor Pitohe, but i wonder I'm, if you have time to answer I'm, I'm, I, I do have i have a few i'm just trying to scroll down quickly sorry um yeah. is the next one from um, Nirmala Jayasuri. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, greetings. Um, my, you said my question is with oxygen-dependent patients with COVID. How I refer, how they refer from ICU when we we call into do screening. Is there a specific screening tool that, that is uh, recommended? Uh, no, not necessarily, Nirmala. Um, I think the, the the main issue around uh, looking at oxygen-dependent patients is where the oxygen is being administered. So if it's through a nasal cannula versus um, an oral uh, mask, then of course you, you're going to need to know how to manage that during the assessment because some of the key things you're going to be assessing uh, requires of you to you know do an intraoral to an oral cavity assessment and, and so forth. So the idea is is that it's not precluded from your screening a person with, who's oxygen dependent, but it's about how that oxygen administration, the modality, the source of that is managed during your assessment. Um, um, and if that, that question is tied in Nirmala to the issue of people on oxygen through and by the use of a tracheostomy tube, then that's a different story. Um, essentially, and I'm just gonna draw the lens back a little bit, there are two key uh, criterion or two key methodologies that I think are pretty important to use, especially in an ICU context, is to look at prandial desaturation. So to look at the way in which um, oxygen saturation occurs, uh, during the, the event or just before, during, and just after the swallow occurs. So if you are assessing a person and you notice that there's a, uh, there's a desaturation event and wait for this, it's different from, from your, your standard adult, for example, it's a desaturation of 3% or more for a period of up to 60 seconds plus anything greater than 60 seconds, and it's a stable decrease, then you can almost with a certain degree of certainty, uh, associate that swallow event with an aspiration uh, event. Uh, of course, it's not 100% foolproof in terms of doing that, but the idea is that the oxygen desaturation that lasts for over a specific period of time is a good indicator that it's associated with the swallow. Uh, and especially, or more, more, more especially, if it's something that's not um, obvious, or if it's a silent aspiration. Uh, Nirmala, I hope that that uh, manages to answer your question. Thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Mershan. I'm Nirmala. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then I've got a question from Nina. Um, there's a misconception among medical staff that a cuffed trachea tube prevents aspiration and therefore tends to start and tend to start feeding while mm -hmm. the trachea tube is inflated. Uh, yes, okay, I, and I'm glad you raised that. Um, the issue there isn't so much the inflation of the, the tube, Nina, itself per se but it's whether it's a high volume, um, high pressure to um, a cuff or not. And if the, 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 the cuff is inflated and it has, um, and it's pressure is high, of course it's going to be um, painful on swallowing, but also it's going to over time, if this occurs frequently, which of course we do quite often, we swallow very often, uh, will uh, also be a contributing factor to check esophageal fistula. So, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you think about the fact that you're swallowing and the tube, the, the cuff itself, will consistently scrape against a particular area, tissue necrosis and all sorts of things set in, depending obviously on the, the stay of the patient or the, the how long this patient has been tracheostomized and how long that, that cuff is managing to be inflated for. So, so yes, there is, a, I agree with you about the misconception there, 
but there's also the possibility that's been explored of, of feeding patients with cuffs that have low pressure. Um, and, th and that's, that's, that's a possibility, especially for patients who are ventilated and uh, need their inflated um, a cuff to allow for the ventilation. Um, sorry? I think there's one more question. Sure. Okay, fine. So I've got yeah. it's from F F Fatima Faroz. What is the role of di the dietitian you expect in dysphagia management? So happy that you, you've raised this question. Um, so I've often described myself as a speech therapist working with dysphagia as the mechanic. And, and so I'm particularly interested in how something, how the oral pharyngeal and esophageal phase works. And uh, I have no knowledge or expertise in what to, to give to feed this patient. So in terms of nutrition and the hydration requirements, I defer mm -hmm. to the dietitian. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize or uh, just sort of bring into uh, square focus is the reference to um, the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. And to look at the fact that there's definitely overlap between diet modifications, which is your domain as a speech therapist, versus what goes into that diet, um, into the menu. And so, for example, a classic one is um, when you thicken water, if you're using a modified cornstarch or if you're using a xanthan gum or any other product that thickens water, is it as bioavailable as we think it is? And there are some studies that show that it's not as available to the body as it should be because of, for example, the starch complicating the uptake of the liquid, or it may be, uh, it may be equivalent to drinking water. So there's, there's lots of deferring studies and you're gonna get confused messages around that. But the main question, the main point that I'd like to emphasize is the role of the dietitian is essentially obviously for uh, nutrition and hydration purposes. And, um, and maybe if you uh, if you're wanting to talk about this further, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to um, uh, take your query via email because there's a whole range of other issues of scope of practice that I can speak about that are not necessarily uh, that that differ across countries. So we can maybe talk about that as well. Okay. I, uh, uh, yeah, I know. Thank you very much, Professor Philip, for that uh, ex excellent explanations as well as the excellent talk. And on behalf of the SLMA uh, Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation, I would like to thank you so much uh, for uh, you know, giving this lecture to us. And yes. thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you very you much for, for all the participants as well. Thanks, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.